The English poet William Blake said, One law for the lion and ox is oppression. In an age of equality, we tend to think that everyone should be treated the same, everyone should be subject to the same laws. But Blake raises the question, what if people aren't exactly equal in every respect? Is it right to subjugate different kinds of people under the same laws? Should lions be under the same laws as oxen? The reason this is an interesting question to me is because of the present political landscape of the United States. The country is more polarized than ever, and more than ever, the two political parties are championing different kinds of laws. What's interesting is not just that the laws are so different, but that the people themselves on each side of the spectrum are so different. Don't misunderstand me, I believe that all humans, regardless of politics, are equal. What I'm talking about are differences not in value or worth, but in personality, character, and lifestyle. The problem facing our politics right now and going forward is that the people of our country are actually becoming more and more different from each other. We don't even live in the same places. Our country is divided between the city and the countryside, and city life is very different from life in the rural countryside. And those differences show up in our personalities and politics. It's really not surprising that cities tend to be more liberal than the rural countryside. Liberalism is very people-oriented. It's about toleration and accepting other people. So it makes sense that people who live in population-dense areas would naturally tend to be more tolerant, at least in theory. Hence the liberal proclivity for intersectional identity politics, accepting gay marriage, and open border immigration, among other other things. When it comes to fiscal policy, if you live in a city, you rely on other people, which means you are far more inclined to support spending, especially spending that benefits you, since you are more reliant on the government for infrastructure, law enforcement, etc. Welfare is an interesting example of the liberal spirit because it says two things at once. On the one hand, it exemplifies the spirit of caring for other people who are in need and wanting to improve life for everyone. Yet at the same time, liberals don't want to be the ones themselves who help others. They want the government to help them. Liberals want to care about people, but also don't want to be the ones to help them. Or at least they think the government is more effective at helping people than they are. In either case, they rely on someone else to do the helping. Conservatives, on the other hand, tend to believe very strongly in personal responsibility. And this also culminates in two paradoxical outcomes. On the one hand, this means conservatives are against government spending, are against welfare, because they believe people should help themselves. Yet what's interesting is that it also means that conservatives give far more to charity and are far more generous than liberals because conservatives actually take responsibility on themselves for helping people rather than outsourcing responsibility to the government. The spirit of conservatism is, I am going to take responsibility for myself and others. I don't need you. I am independent and will be independent. And this explains why a lot of conservatives live in rural areas, out in the country or the mountains, away from large groups of people. Out there you are independent. You fend for yourself. You rely on yourself and no one bothers you. You can dig a hole in your yard without a permit. You can shoot rifles in your backyard and live the life you want to live. The reason why rural people are so pro-gun is because they believe in empowering individuals and having the ability to fend for yourself. In the countryside, if you get into trouble or someone breaks into your house or someone is out to get you, you're on your own. No one's coming to help you. Not for a while. You can call 911, but it's going to take a while for them to respond. You have to be able to take care of yourself. If you're not going to get hurt or worse, you have to be able to defend yourself and that means having a firearm. When it comes to toleration and acceptance, the reason why conservatives seem like they're not as tolerant as liberals is not because they are mean or hateful, although they may come across that way sometimes, but it's because they're independent. They don't feel the need to tolerate people and they themselves don't want to be accepted. They are most happy being left alone. They couldn't care less what other people think about them. They just want to live their own lives. Moreover, being independent means that you speak your mind and hold your own views without regard for other people's feelings. There's a higher degree of mental toughness. They are willing to stand up for themselves and even to get into a brawl in order to defend their pride. They are more than happy to fight things out without getting personal, so it's no wonder that they come across as mean, calloused, and judgmental to other more sensitive people. Now my goal here is not to argue for one side or the other but rather to point out how differences in personalities lead to different kinds of politics, and to argue that our fundamental problem is not political, but ethical in nature. An important question going forward will be, how can people who are so fundamentally different live together? Can people who want different things live under one kind of law?
Liberalism and conservatism are not merely political, they are moral in nature and based on fundamentally different kinds of values, whether those values be tolerance, acceptance, personal responsibility, self-reliance, freedom, independence, progress, or stasis. And these moralities can be traced to different kinds of personalities. Liberalism is defined by the morality of acceptance. You must not judge, you must not be mean, unless someone transgresses that morality. Conservatism is defined by the the morality of independence and self-responsibility. You shall not encroach on my liberty. You shall not force me to do something that I don't want to do. None of these positions are grounded in reason or facts. They are all based in value and emotion. All of the different political stances are inherently emotional, and this is so crucial to realize because if our differences are based on values, then rational arguments will do little to nothing to change values, because reason and facts don't change values and emotions. Values and emotions can only be replaced with other values and other emotions. Consider the abortion debate. Abortion is not really about whether a fetus is a human person, it's not really about women's rights over their bodies, it's about fear. An unplanned pregnancy is scary. Women are afraid to lose the single independence that they had before they were pregnant. They are afraid of the pain and the hardship of caring for a child that they frankly don't want to care for. That's a very, very powerful emotion. And if you want to be pro-life, you have to replace that fear with stronger values. Pro-lifers have to portray in brilliant colors the goodness of family, the existential benefits of not having sex until you are married and ready to have children, and the heroism of doing the hard things, putting children first, and why bearing this responsibility enriches your life with meaning and ultimately makes your life better. Fiscal conservatives will have to demonstrate how people are happier when they help themselves, how you respect yourself more when you realize that you are entitled to nothing and you take responsibility for everything in your life. Conservatives need to demonstrate that you really only start to live when you realize the power within you not to be a victim and that no one can make you a victim if you don't let them, no matter what what happens to you, you can refuse to be defined by your circumstances. You can refuse to be defined by other people. At the end of the day, our politics requires a revolution in values. The German poet and philosopher Friedrich Schiller said, the road that terminates in the head must pass through the heart. Accordingly, the most pressing need of the present time is to educate the sensibility because it is the means not only to render efficacious in practice the improvement of ideas, but to call this improvement into existence. The same is true of our own day. The question for us going forward is what are the best values and how do we set those values alight in people's hearts?